Hi, I'm Kat Powers and you're watching SCAT TV. Today we have a discussion about the bus and bike lanes that we're finding installed all over the city. I have with me two experts on the subject. <laughs> One is former mayor and former congressman, Mike Capuano. I also have with me Chris Duan, an avid cyclist, member of Safe Streets, and uh, you'll know him on Twitter as SummerShade1. Um, tonight's forum, we will be having um, a discussion here among us, and then uh, field questions from the audience, and also from our Facebook Live feed. So um, what do you think about bike lanes, bus lanes? Generally, I'm supportive of them. I think uh, the concept is a good concept. Um, but like any good concept, you have to apply it in real the real world. And to me, the big question is whether um, this particular bus lane, which is mostly the one on Broadway, um, has accomplished the things that it said it was going to accomplish. And whether the city is even concerned about reviewing whether it has or not. Uh, I, as a resident of Winter Hill, I'm not aware that the city has, has looked at it since they installed it. Uh, I'll be perfectly honest, before they installed it, I'm not aware of any meetings they had to discuss it. Um, so it feels as though it was simply implemented from on high with uh, no concern about the input or comments or concerns about the people who actually live in Winter Hill. And for me, that's the biggest concern. Uh, but the concept of bus lanes, great concept. The concept of bike lanes, great concept. Uh, how, could you, how could you oppose them? Uh, but it's not a concept. We don't live in a concept. We live in a real world. And when you at when you apply a concept in the real world, the question: Does it work here? And does it accomplish the things you said you tried you were trying to do? I would argue, at least in this one, first of all, we don't know because no one studied it. No one set a, a baseline. Nobody set any goals. And second of all, no one's talking about it now. And I will tell you that as a resident of Winter Hill, I would love to engage in those conversations as a neighbor. Um, and I know many of my neighbors would like to discuss that uh, and going forward. The bus lane's been there for three years. People have lived with it and they have very strong opinions one way or the other. And I don't find anything wrong with having people's opinions heard. I actually think that's what government should be all about. The, the bike lanes themselves, are they problematic? Um, again, the answer is everything, no matter what you do, it's a, it provides some problems. The question is, is the benefit better than the detriment? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, some bike lanes are more beneficial than they are detrimental. Some are more detrimental than they are beneficial. It depends whether you have it. Um, so for the sake of discussion, if you put a bike lane on Highland Ave, they'll probably be detrimental because the street's just not wide enough. And it's a heavily residential street. If you took parking off of that, you're impacting thousands of, of long-term residents. Um, now, again, I know some people would disagree with that, and I respect that, but that's my opinion. Uh, the bike lanes elsewhere, a bike lane on Broadway, is, is generally works reasonably well. Um, I think there are places it does, some places it doesn't. Has parking been removed? Yes, parking has been removed. The city um, has done that repeatedly on many, many places. And again, you could argue whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. Again, it's a benefit and a detriment. Obviously, there's always a benefit to adding more parking. There are many more cars in the city than it was designed for, no matter how you measure it. I just took a quick spin around Union Square. There are going to be a lot more people living in Union Square that have no parking. I don't know where they're going to park. I know some of them won't have cars, but some will. And I don't know whether that was taken into consideration or not, or whether anybody cares. Um, and that's, that's again, that's as long as it's a determined policy, you can agree with it or disagree with it, but how did you get to that policy? And again, what's the goal of the policy? So uh, is, it an, is it detrimental? Some of them are. And in particular on Broadway, the bike lane that works from Goon Square up to Main Street seems to be fine. I mean, you, I, I know there are some people that wishes that the cars were parked along the curb as opposed to out two or three feet. I think that's more of a detail than anything else. But the concept of having a bike lane on that stretch of Broadway hasn't really had much of a negative impact that I'm aware of, um, but other than, but again, I think you can make a different argument in different places. Chris, you're a pro very much a proponent of bike lanes. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so it, there are. It, this has been a city where we've had cars for time at Memoriam. It it we used to manufacture cars here. Right. This is very much a city where. Uh, the elderly, those who live in places far off and come back to our fair city, they, they use their cars. Is there, is there a, 
what should we what should we be doing differently? So backing up just a little, you mentioned the Safe Streets Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, the Safe Streets Alliance was born out of a question. The question was, is there anything that the activists of this city can actually agree on outside of our activisms? Right. So we had leaders in um, cycling, yes, but pedestrian transit users, seniors, folks who were trying to age in place, disabled folks, you know, environmentalists, and it was a series of conversations. And what we could agree on was everybody should be safe on our streets. And when we design our infrastructure on our streets, it should be designed for equitable access so that everybody can meaningfully get around. Just pausing there, we agreed on something, right? And it wasn't just bike lane, right? That's pretty far from saying, yes, always bike lane. Um, so we continued that conversation and it turned into this, uh, this little 17 pager that we wrote. Um, describing infrastructure features that actually do work for disabled folks and for people with young kids and for seniors and for cyclists, to, you know. And it's things like taking the bus stop and making it into a floating island so the bus doesn't have to go through whatever else is going on. It can stay in the lane, right? And then you can have through traffic that doesn't have a bus impinging on it. It's things like dedicated lanes for buses so that the transit service can be really, really consistent, which is what you need to get people to move from cars over to non-cars, right? And so that kind of really deep kind of brave conversation where you open up and you say, I'm gonna not just push my thing, and instead you come together across boundaries, there's a lot of space for agreement. And so I don't think it's as simple as just bike lane yes, bike lane no, parking yes, parking no, because I think what we see in the city is we can't all have everything and we're all going to have to compromise. <laughs> Do we see that kind of compromise, those public discussions about whether and where are the bike lanes? No. No? Not even close. And, I, and I, I actually want to go back to the word equitable. That term is used a lot by a lot of people for a lot of things. In this particular case, it's not defined. What is equity? Is equity everybody who does transit has equal say? Or does it mean it is equity how many people use cars versus how many people use bikes versus how many people, and, and again, there's no answer to that. It's how, it's what you bring to the table. I would argue that part of equity should be how many people are using what form of transit. And if there are more people using cars than using bikes, or more people using bikes than using cars, there should be more of the road dedicated to that use. If there's a social purpose to try to move people out of a certain type of transit, say so, and have that discussion if that's your goal. It's a fair goal, but say it. And I don't. I know that none of those discussions have taken place. Uh, if they have, they've taken place in living rooms and not, even, mm -hmm. not in a public forum. Can I, may I respond to that? Yes. Um, so I went back and I looked for like the last 10 years of what I could find on public process toward policy in Somerville. And uh, there was this thing called Summer Vision in 2011 or so. And one of the primary goals in there was to move us from being a more car dependent city to making, making it possible to get around with less dependence on cars. Bunch of different reasons for that. They all point in the same direction, right? When we revisited Summer Vision 10 years later, that again rose absolutely to the top. When, and these were projects of, of hundreds of people and dozens of meetings and tabling at the farmer's markets and you know, eventually rising to presentations at city council, city council endorsing it. Um, same with Climate Forward. This was an exhaustive process that led to reducing the use of cars, you know, one of the things, you know, reducing, moving towards transit and not requiring cars to get around. One thing I want to say, there are people in the city who must use cars to get around. We are never going to hit zero cars, right? And we should focus our infrastructure on, in, on making it, 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 you've mentioned equity, making it meaningfully possible for the folks who have mobility challenges such that they really do need to get around by car, that they have spaces near where they live and near where they need to go. And we don't just use that to block progress towards these other city goals. And, and I don't disagree with anything you said, but since 2011, there were no fewer cars going through some of them than there were in 2011. There were no fewer resident parking stickers being given out. There were no fewer traffic problems. I mean, so therefore, the goal is a wonderful goal, but it hasn't achieved it. It hasn't gone that far, number one. Number two, when you say there were dozens of meetings and hundreds of people, I've been doing public meetings all my life. 
And the problem with public meetings, you get the same hundred people to the same hundred meetings. And, and this is a city of 90,000 people. The vast majority of people do not attend meetings, do not get on Zoom, do not get on Twitter, do not get on Facebook, and yet they should remain voiceless? I think not. I think it is the public official's duty to then go out and reach out to those people who don't show up to these meetings and ask their opinion. Drop a leaflet, knock on doors, talk to people who don't come to these meetings and find out what they think and to listen to them. And so for me, I don't oppose any of the things you just said. And by the way, let's talk about the environment for one minute. I think the environmental goals, are, I've had asthma since I was three years old. Uh, this city has been terribly polluted. My record on cleaning up the pollution of this city, I think, is unmatched. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. However, I will suggest very clearly that the bus lane, and it's not just a bike lane, it's a bus lane on Broadway, has actually increased pollution on Winter Hill. Yes, buses travel, the city claims, approximately 30 seconds faster to transit that one-half-mile stretch of the road. And so therefore, I'll accept the fact that buses are creating less pollution. Cars pollute too, and they pollute most when they are idling. More cars are idling on Winter Hill than ever before because of that bus lane. Now again, if the goal is to just move buses faster, say it. Say we don't care about the environmental aspect of it, we don't care about the rest of the items, or we're willing to accept it. But you can't claim environmentalism and then make the environment worse, at least not in my opinion. And you can't say, well, we're gonna do everything we can to get people out of the cars and then fail at it for 20 years and think and keep doing the same thing. I'm not opposed to these things. I'm just opposed to simply saying that in a philosophical basis, without any actual study of whether it's working, or whether there are other ways to do it, without reaching out to people. I'm only aware of one meeting that took place, and I'm not sharing the word more, one meeting that took place that people were leafleted to go to to talk about the bus lane, and it was actually once the bus lane was done. And I know that because I'm the one who leafleted it. And we leafleted the entire neighborhood. We had over 100 people show up at the liquor store on the corner of Maine and Moreland. Nine, literally, literally 99 people there were opposed to the bus lane. Now again, granted some of them maybe were more concerned that they weren't asked or they weren't discussed before and they just showed up in their opinion one, one day. But the city basically said too bad. Too bad we're doing that. And I just think that that's a terrible way to run a city. It's a terrible way to implement policy. It's a terrible way to change people's opinions to, to find agreement, to find common ground. I don't think any of your goals are bad. I think they're all good. I do think that they can find consensus on some of these things. However, you have to talk to people outside the group that's advocating to try to find a way to do that or just ignore the people's concerns who don't agree with you. So I do want to lean on that a little bit because I spoke with Brad Rawson, our Director of Mobility, this morning. And, uh, he was at that meeting, by the way. Okay. He um, reminded me that there was this term for the planning process for the Winter Hill, uh, Winter Hill in Motion. And it turns out it's still up on the city website. And I understand the digital divide is real. You know. But if you go to the bottom of summerbellamay.gov slash Winter Hill in Motion, you'll find the presentations from a whole series of meetings that somehow did not get the attention, Bingo. did not get the participation. So that's a huge gap there. And it's shocking to me that, like Brad shared the results of the studies they did on the before and after. So prior to putting in those, uh, the painted bus lanes, they had been doing speed and traffic studies. And in January, February 2020, so pre-lockdown, they measured more. And what they found from the MBTA data was that 30% more people were riding the bus um, on the weekdays, 60% more on the weekends. Thousands of people using that service. From the police data, we had 25% reduction in crashes over this comparable periods, right? In terms of speed measurements, which were done on particular days, um, prior, 50% of the cars on Broadway were speeding. And after, less than 30%, which you could make an argument there was traffic, right? Um, and then, I, I believe you mentioned the speed up in transit for buses, but the loss in the transit time for cars on that same stretch, you know, Magoon down to McGrath uh, was 30 seconds on average. And the, and the speed up on the buses was 30 seconds. And by the way, the mayor, two weeks ago, I attended a community meeting, at the, which the mayor said herself, I don't know the numbers, 12,000 cars a day still travel that section of, Bell, of Broadway. Mm -hmm. That's more than the number of bus rides. That's more than the number of bus riders plus bikers, way more. 
Now, I think some of the people have argued, well, a lot of some of those cars are just transiting through some of them. Fair point. First of all, they are, and they are impacting those of us who live here because we, I, no one yet has found a way to stop them from coming in. But by the way, on those buses, two thirds of the bus or the 101 bus, it starts in Malden and comes to Medford. Two thirds of the people riding that bus, actually more than that, by 80 percent, don't live in Somerville. Mm -hmm. So, okay, when everything's said and done, I'm not arguing it's probably safer. The safest roads in the entire world are there are no cars and no bikes, and that's fair. When you have an automobile and when you have a, a, a bicycle or any moving entity, you have to accept some degree of danger and some degree of responsibility for minimizing that danger. Don't argue with that at all. And absolutely, safety should be the top goal. But if pure safety is the only goal, and commuting is not a concern, time con value is not a concern, environment's not a concern, if the only concern is safety, fine, that's a reasonable approach, not reasonable, it's, it's responsible, you'll have no cars, and you'll have no bikes, and you'll have no nothing. And I just think that's a, that's a ridiculous place to go. So if you're going to have cars, you're going to have some safety concerns. Should they be minimized? Absolutely. You know, do I think it's probably safer when cars are not moving? Of course. Yeah, and, and like I said, but at the same time, you end up with greater pollution, more wasted man hours, because people are now sitting in traffic. And by, by that, it's not just a few cars. It's 12,000, and that's not my number. And it, that's way more than the number of bus riders. And by the way, has anybody even considered what's going to happen? That's the 101 bus. The 89 bus comes out of Davis Square. I'm guessing, I don't know this, that a fair number of people that ride the 89 are probably going to jump on the green line the minute it opens. I hope they do. That's why we just spent $2.5 billion to build the green line. That's why we put a bike path along the green line. That's why we did it. And I think it's a great thing to do. When that happens, is the city going to relook at any of these things? And thus far, to this moment, no. And by the way, the city looked at those things immediately after putting the bus lane in, just before COVID hit. And I would argue that I could, I could make a strong argument against some of those conclusions. I don't believe they looked at the number of cars using Bond Street now, getting diverted off of Broadway, or using Heath Street, or using Moreland, or any of the other side streets that now get jammed up on a regular basis. And if you don't believe me, Take your automobile or your bike, Google a direction from Broadway to Stop and Shop to Home Depot, whatever you want. Ten, three, four, five years ago, Google would never send you down Bond Street. Mm -hmm. It would never send you down Heath. It would send you straight down Broadway to Temple or straight down Broadway to McGrath. Now it does. Why does that happen? You know better than I do. Google's an algorithm. More people go down Bond Street, we're going to start telling more people to get on Bond Street. So guess what? Google now tells you to get on Bond Street. Why? To avoid traffic and lights on Broadway to be able to get to your destination faster. I don't think, I don't think, I am absolutely positive there was no studies done on Bond, no studies done on Evergreen, no studies done on Central Street. We've seen more traffic on Central Street than ever, ever since the bus lane has opened up. And again, if the goal is something different, tell me. Has anybody studied the time distance? And by the way, when they say there's faster traffic going that way, they're measuring it, I believe they're measuring it from the beginning of the bus lane to the end of the bus lane. How about from the end of the bus, well, whatever you want, the Main Street intersection, back to Magoon Square in the morning? There was never traffic backed up to Magoon Square in the morning. There is now, and that includes buses. So they may pick up 30 seconds from Main to McGrath. I wonder how much time they lose before they hit Main Street. And all I'm saying is, Again, the goal doesn't bother me. I actually think it's a good goal. And all the goals you've mentioned are all good goals. Does this particular project accomplish the goals they claimed they want to do? And I think, honestly, it's a pretty simple answer. The answer is no. It accomplishes some of them, but it doesn't accomplish the majority of them. And, it, and I think that the general population should be engaged in the discussion and their interests should be heard. And they haven't been. And I understand that the city might have their wonderful little studies all over the place. I used to do them too. But the difference is we actually went out and then talked to people. Here's a study. Here's what we think we should do. What do you think? You know, you live here. How are you going to drive? How are you going to ride? And if it was done, I will tell you that as a resident of Winter Hill, I didn't know it was getting done. And yeah, I don't know anybody and, else who does. And I want to say that that's a huge gap because you're fantastically connected. You've been a public service servant for decades. I meant to open up by saying thank you for that. It's an honor to be here with you, you know? And so somehow, 
we have, uh, and you mentioned the, the regional nature of it, these buses that start out of Somerville and go out of Somerville. So this is a, like many things, like almost everything. It's bigger than our four and a half square miles, right? right? The T has added service on these routes because we've built infrastructure that supports added service. It's a good use of regional money and staff to send more buses down lanes when we make space for them. So does that solve every problem all at once? Certainly not. But if people, one of the things that is true is that you're not gonna change behavior until people have a meaningful alternative, right? right? We're stuck. We're stuck with this car infrastructure, right? And there's gonna be discomfort as you open up routes and like anything else in society, people take so long to change their behavior, to change their minds. It's gotta be like trust, trustworthy for years. So what we've gotta do, I believe, is make space for the service to be meaningfully good enough that people begin changing their be uh, behavior, first start taking the bus to work, to assembly, to wherever else, then eventually shift away from the dependence on the car, eventually maybe give up on the car entirely. It's gonna take years. It's right. going to take generations, and I don't disagree yeah. with anything you said. However, in the meantime, there are real people going to real jobs, having real families that they want to get back to today, right now, mm -hmm. not 100 years from now, not 10 years from now, right now, every single day, and I think their needs today have to be part of the discussion, and most people I know don't think they are. So for the sake of discussion, uh, if they had had more open discussions, Again, I've been a resident of Winter Hill for 40 years. If they wanted to talk to me about taking the median strip out, widening the street, keeping two lanes of traffic, not all the way necessarily, adding a bike lane, I don't think there would have been a problem with that. At least there would have been some. There's always some problem. And in general, I think people have said, okay, why? The median strip is very nice, but nobody uses it. And there'll be plants there, and nobody walks across the street except the crosswalks, you know. It's, it, so therefore, taking that median strip out, would have provided plenty of room to actually accomplish a bike lane, which would have provided the safety that you're concerned with, and I actually think the same thing. I'm, I'm, I don't think it would have been an ounce of problem with that. But to then take a bus lane all 24 hours a day, at least on Mr. Gab, they only use it during rush hours, which, again, I would argue in, for a half a mile doesn't accomplish almost anything. And the likelihood of them then extending it from McGrath to Sullivan is virtually non-existent because the city just spent tens of millions of dollars redoing all of Lower Broadway. And from Main Street West, you can't do it because the wall is there, the, just, the street's just not wide enough, unless you take out all parking, which again, some people might advocate, that's fine. But the likelihood is probably not very serious. So that bus lane is going to be a half a mile long forever. And is this bus lane the answer, and I would argue that there's serious questions as to whether it is, and I, my main argument is that the city should be asking these questions, if not now, certainly when the Green Line opens up. Let's see how bus ridership is when the Green Line opens up. Mm -hmm. And if the answer is going to be concerned about the 101, that services more than a Medford, fine. But if the answer is going to be worried about the 89, tell me who's riding the 89. Today is one thing. Hopefully, I mean, I've heard this before, but hopefully in a few months, we'll have the Green Line going. And my hope is that that is worthwhile, and a lot of the people in the 89 will be now be riding the Green Line. I mm -hmm. think they will. All that being said, that's what I'm really after. I'm not against bus lanes. I'm not against bike lanes. I, I think, again, the, if I lived in a field, if I lived in Kansas, and I was building some of them today, we'd have bus lanes and bike lanes on every street. I don't. I live in the most densely populated city in the face of the earth in the 1950 census and the most densely populated city in New England today. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't design the streets. We inherited them. That's just the way it is. People actually park on the streets. A lot of people do. And I know people say that they're, well, you know, we're trying to get away from cars, and I'm, I'm all for that. I would like that. That's not going to happen mm -hmm. probably in my lifetime. It would be a wonderful goal. Probably not going to happen. What do we do in the meantime? Just tell people who are parking the streets, too bad? We're gonna tell, we tell people who drive either to work or to school to drop their kids off, wherever they're going to shop, too bad? I, I just, again, with 90,000 people, I think the vast majority of people would, if they were heard, if they were listened to, if they were solicited, would feel differently. Well, I think there's a space for leadership here. I think there's a space for courageous leadership. And uh, so we did just have a, uh, pretty vigorous elected election process. Um, so far as I'm aware, every city councilor ran with street safety 
as a piece of their platform. And our mayor ran with street safety as a piece of our platform. There were alternatives. They didn't make it past the primaries. Right? So I think the people were pretty decisive in supporting that as an aspect of both the no legislature and the No one's opposed to well, No one's so, opposed to motherhood and apple pie either. And so practically speaking, one of the things I love about living in this age, one of the few things about living in this age, I am absolutely sure that we know more today than we knew 50 years ago about engineering, about how to build cities that work, about how to build things that work. As you said, we inherited this infrastructure. We inherited decisions from 50 and 100 and 150 years ago that we live with. You know, It's on us today to make courageous decisions and reach out, and we will never get to a point where everybody is happy necessarily. My goal is to get to everybody is safe and meaningful, meaningfully able to get around. right? And right now we have people who are not safe, who are not meaningfully able, able to get around, and it's right, the cars are absolutely in the way. And as I said at the beginning, we're not going to know cars. People need some people in the city, but absolutely I reliant. Agreed. I haven't disagreed with anything you said. Right, and all I'm saying is we know what to do, and we know how to do it, and we should. Well, I don't know, I don't, I, I, that now I'm not so sure I, I agree with you anymore. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to do? How did you know that this was the right way to go on Broadway? How do you know that today? How do you know this, and, and by the way, even if you feel like you know it, who anointed you? What about the rest of the people who may or may not agree with you? And I don't mean elected official. I've been an elected official most of these years. Guess what? I, I will give you an example. One of the last things I tried to do as mayor is to build a trash transfer station. Trying to, we were really pushing recycling at the time, and we needed a new trash transfer station to do it. I lost. Doesn't mean I didn't try it. It meant I lost. I couldn't get the votes on the city council to, to do it. The city council opposed it. They didn't want it. We didn't get it. All that being said, there was nothing wrong with having elected officials who say, first of all, who would be against street safety? I, 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 would, I would love to meet that elected official because they wouldn't be an elected official very long. Everybody's for that. What does it mean? And what does it mean to the average person who lives here? And how, what's the balance mm -hmm. between, okay, I'm all for safety, but if, if it's really, if it's only street safety, as I said, get rid of all the cars. Well, no, and no. get rid of all the bikes, too, by the way. And, and, that's, and that's a straw man, and we live in the real world. Of course. Right? And that's why, I mean, Somerville is not inventing infrastructure to move people around. You know, we're not asked to invent anew the way we do this. And we are, I would say, because of what we inherited, far, far behind a lot of cities in terms of just coming up to modern. And I think modern is a meaningfully usable transit system that people can rely on to get themselves around I agree. in you know, predictable amounts of time. Reason it should not take somebody two transfers on buses totally to get agree. from where they live to where they get food. You know, they should not have to uh, cross three lanes in one direction, three lanes in the other to get from where they live to food, to shopping, to school, to church, to totally whatever. Agree. So we have these gaps and the question is, okay, are we going to put a straw man and say, oh, no cars anymore? Are we going to say, no, look, the buses are too slow and they're not reliable and people aren't using them. Make space on the most heavily used bus route in the city. It seems like a decent place to start, right? And at the same time that you're doing that, put in physically protected infra infrastructure for uh, cyclists, but only on the uphill side because that's where you lag. And then the downhill side, you've got space to move, right? It seems like a very reason, and, and I hear you, that there were people who were surprised. We were talking before we went on the air about the fact that there was a mismatch. There was not coordination with the police. There was not coordination on the signal timing changes. There was a month of chaos there. It was terrible. And I say that now, from mid-2019 to late 2022, it's a big improvement. Sure, it's only a half mile. It's a half mile we didn't have before. It's a half mile that's closer to right. If we're going to talk about taking the median, cool. That was not a project where they were able to move the curbs. You know, that's a big full depth thing. Not you know? necessarily. Yeah. It doesn't have to be full depth to move a curb. Mm -hmm. they okay, for those time. of us playing mm -hmm. at home, what is full depth to be? Going down and changing all the sewers <laughs> and the waterworks, really ripping the street up and really doing it new, like they just did uh, portions of Somerville Ave. Mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can move a curb without doing a full depth reconstruction. And I, and I actually don't think Broadway needs one because that all of Broadway was done full depth reconstruction, late, late 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's probably needed. But, and again, I'm not even saying that's an answer, but, and for me, I would also argue very clearly, why doesn't somebody ask the people on Winter Hill? And I don't care how you define Winter Hill, don't get me wrong, just ask your opinion. It doesn't mean you have to listen to them, it doesn't mean you have to do whatever it is they say, but ask. 
you know, put it on a ballot, you know, just or maybe just do an informal type of thing, ask their opinion. And let's have a let's have those open discussions. I don't understand, and, and you're right. I, I think the city handled it horrendously when they put it in. I don't think it's gotten any better. I think it's just as bad as it ever was. As far as and again, the fact that they haven't come back and restudied it. The fact that, to my knowledge, there's no plan to restudy it once the green line opens. What impact is that going to have? My hope is it has a great and tremendous impact, both getting people out of the buses and getting them out of their cars. I hope that and getting them off their bikes. I want them all to be riding the Green Line because it was cost two and a half billion dollars. I, <laughs> I want it to be worth it. So I, I don't have, again, the goals that you have stated, every goal you have stated, I share. And I think most people do. That's not the debate. The question is, how do you get from where we are to where you want to be? And we disagree on what you're willing to give up today in order to get to that goal. And, and even I shouldn't say we even disagree. I question it. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I know how I feel about it individually because I drive it every single day, multiple times a day. Uh, and I, and I, I'm, not, I'm pretty convinced it has not achieved the goals it was intended to achieve. And I think there are better ways to do that, particularly for bike safety. Uh, I think that would be much easier to achieve. And again, even, even a simple thing, like having the bus lanes only during rush hour, would be a welcome change to most people who live in that neighborhood. It would actually, I think, improve life and quality of life on a lot of the side streets where traffic is now getting diverted. and might actually improve the environment up there by actually, honestly, decreasing pollution. But God forbid we talk about that. We have to have a full bus lane 24 hours a day on, in both directions. What's the purpose of that? I don't get it. So I have an honest question. Real honest question. You were the mayor. You were an alderman. You were a representative in D.C. Yep. And how do we get the level of engagement that you're talking about that would satisfy you? Hard work. You have to go, have mm -hmm. to, go to where people live. You actually have to get off the chair, off the computer, off the, the robocall, and go knock on their doors and have meetings in their neighborhood. Hard work. It's personal. It gets intense. But it creates wonderful, I think, very positive, pro, pro, proactive energy to actually solve problems in a mutually respectful way. You're never going to get everybody. I get that. That's a, that's a crazy goal. You don't even want everybody because if you've got everybody, you've made a mistake. You know, <laughs> but the vast majority of people, they want to be heard. They want to have their opinions valued. And they want to have that discussion before their world is changed. And if that's not happening, you know, and honestly, I really think in this particular case, like many cases I've seen this all my life, people just give up. They just give up. They just throw their hands up in the air and say, forget it. We'll live with this. Stuff. I saw that happen in some of them my whole life. It went from a city that was wonderful in the 50s to a city that nobody wanted to live, live in in the 80s. And why? Because people just gave up. They built buildings that were terrible buildings. They didn't plant a single tree. They didn't reconstruct a single street. The schools were terrible. They were in bad shape and they were bad education. And people just, and it didn't happen overnight. Nobody came in and did it. They just did it because they could. And I see the same things happening now. We do it because, why? I have a Zoom call. What the hell is a Zoom call? I, I, I've been, done thousands of them. I, I, fine, they're better than nothing. But they're not the same as us sitting here having this conversation over a beer or a cup of coffee and having 10 other people in 10 different houses doing the exact same thing. And I know that that's anathema in the world of politics today, but I still believe it's the best way to get people to actually come to agreements. It's actually the thing that I love about local politics. It's the thing that keeps me engaged. And um, the reason we don't have, the reason we fell to me being here this evening, we were going to have a city councilor. And the city council uh, scheduled a meeting for charter review, where we're looking at the balance between, uh, among other things, the legislature and the mayor. My experience, and I'm in Ward 2, I have a very engaged uh, city councilor who does go out and knock doors and engages in a lot of the conversations that you're describing, right? I find it to be a breath of fresh air, and you know, there's constantly counterpoint. You know, you, like you say, you'll never get everybody. How do we um, get either the executive, the mayor, to commit to that level of engagement, because this is a mayoral decision, yep. or empower the city council, who are so I, closely accountable to the voters that they have to go out and knock doors. I think you ask them, and if they don't want to do it, you don't have to wait for them. You know, you, you, there's, there's no requirement that you have elected officials at these meetings. You invite them, 
and you actually ask them to run them, if they choose not to run them, you can still have the meeting yourself. And if you come up with an, with an answer that you know brings 500 people together on a certain issue, whatever the issue might be, uh, they may not listen to you. And that's part of life. I get that. It's a representative democracy. But that's less likely. Most elected officials will listen to a well-organized group of people. And right now, I see most well-organized groups of people being interest groups around different issues. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not necessarily a community group. A community group is supposed to involve everybody, including people that may not agree. I mean, for instance, there's nothing wrong with having a safe street. But, I mean, if there was a, let's have a non-safe street association, we should listen to them. Not necessarily agree with them, but at least, okay, why don't you like safe streets? What's, what's your problem with this? Yeah, it's one of those where it's, it would actually be a separate thing. It would be a, I wish I had a parking space. I don't like all the construction noise, I, you know, whatever it is. It's not actually opposition to safety. Oh, yeah. but, you know. and, and I don't find anything wrong with those concerns. But here's what we have to do. Here's what we, do, do we agree we want to go to this goal? And if so, here's the first step, here's the second step, here's the third step. Uh, I just did, a, a couple of years ago, I worked over at a, one of the local universities who did a humongous study on uh, in, protecting Boston from climate change, Greater Boston. Great study, fantastic study. When they hired me, I said, look, my job is not to do the study. There are smarter people than me to figure out what we need to do. My job is to then take the people who did the study and explain to them, Greater Boston doesn't have $5 billion to do this. Part of the study should have been, okay, here's what we want to do. Here's what we think we should, if you have a million dollars to do it, here's what you should do. If you have 10 million, here's what you should do. If you have a billion, here's what you should do. Here's what we should do first. That part is missing. And I think it's the same thing with this. Again, every goal you mention, I don't think a reasonable person could disagree with any of your goals. That's not the point. The point is, okay, how do we get from where we are to where you, we, I think, most, if not all of us, want to be? So can and I, I don't think that that, I mean, even if it exists, it exists on a shelf in City Hall and the average person hasn't been listened to because, of course, they don't have an opinion because they're not as educated as the average person who wants to just do the study. That's insulting. And, and I think it's, it's terrible politics, terrible democracy, and I don't think it's true. I, I think anybody who drives or rides or walks these streets has a valuable opinion that should be heard. Not agreed with necessarily, but at least heard. If somebody wants a parking space in front of the house, that's not an unreasonable request. It may not be an achievable request, not an unreasonable thing to talk about. How do we get it? Well, we can't do you if we don't do everybody else. And if we do everybody else, there won't be anything but parking on the street. We can't do that. So how do we balance it? Don't know the answer. But in, in each street, as you know, is different. Mm -hmm. Broadway is not the same thing as Summer Street. Summer Street is not the same thing as Central Street. And each street, I know it's difficult, but it has to be. If it's not done that way, it's just going to be imposed from on high like this was. So one of the really frustrating things about being an activist in the city is that there are so many different priorities and we find ourselves planning and you know the uh, the saying never let a perfectly good crisis go to waste <laughs> right um, in this case in the case of infrastructure that would prevent loss of life we're waiting for people to die so we can have the groundswell of public support that will actually get something done through the endless study through the endless debate through I think a very small number of people who are holding on to an untenable memory that we inherited, right? I feel very personally frustrated that we have to wait for people to die in the street before we do the basic stuff that we know we should have done to save lives, right? That's my perspective on safe streets ad advocacy. And again, we started this SAS group um, on the question of can we bring together, you know, if we had the conversation with the chair, the former chair of the Commission for Persons with Disabilities, and uh, the aging in place organizations like STEP, you know, and, 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 and all of us together agreed on not just directionally, like the streets are damn unsafe, and we are worried for ourselves, our relatives, our kids, our neighbors, and here are specific infrastructure things that would make us safer, all of us together, right? I have to say, it's, it's frustrating then to say, well, there was some corner of the city that, didn't, that, that was not there. And I get you, it's so, if you want so to hard. If involved in public policy, embrace frustration. <laughs> it, 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 there's no way around it yeah. if you truly value other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. I, I, my whole life has been based on frustration. 
I, I've always thought, I still think, that if you make me emperor, the world will be perfect, <laughs> uh, according to me. And uh, that's the nature of public policy. When you get more than two people who want to do the same thing, somebody's going to get a little frustrated. Mm -hmm. When you get a thousand people wanting to do head in the same direction, a thousand people are going to be frustrated. And that's just the nature of public policy. So do I, I I'm sorry, I, I can't feel sorry for you <laughs> no, in the sense that it, you want to change anything. No. And there were, there have been just massive successes where we had the intersection of Mystic and McGrath, where we had the fourth pedestrian in two years died in traffic, right, struck by driver, right? And we were able to bring together administration and uh, city council and representatives at the federal level yep. and, you know, and we actually caused MassDOT to move a little tiny bit faster than they had been going to, right? right? And now we've got curb cuts and signalized crossing between uh, that grocery store and Foss Park, you know. But it's still the worst intersection. That whole intersection mm -hmm. has been the worst intersection in Greater Boston for 50 years. It's not new. Mm -hmm. And they still haven't done it. I mean, that I know exactly. I drive that every day. Yeah. I think it's a wonderful change. You're talking about right, near, right behind the stop and shop in exactly. particular. It's a great change. Yeah, the raised crosswalk but, and the light and the but everything. But if you walk, if you drive that neighborhood or walk that neighborhood, you'll see a lot of people, they do cross there, but they also then, some, walk down Mr. Gav, crossing over McGrath Highway on the, on the side nearest Medford, probably going to Ten Hills. I don't know exactly where they're going, and nothing has been done about that. I have no disagreement. That entire intersection from the from Temple Street up to where you're talking about, actually maybe beyond, but at least mm -hmm. there, has to be completely reviewed. I will tell you that we originally had a proposal to add another tunnel going the other direction, coming, right, we have a tunnel now going nor uh, north, I guess it would be. The other one's to put one coming south. Why? To calm that whole traffic, mm -hmm. that whole area. The state didn't want to do it. You know, so do I think that that's a great addition? Yeah, I do. I think it's a wonderful addition and it's a good victory. A lot more needs to be done at that intersection to make it safe in any real sense where it's a good step in the right mm -hmm. direction, but a lot more needs to be done and could be relatively done relatively easily and cheaply, yeah. I think. I mean, the biggest thing there, and we're, uh, we're stop us if we get too far afield. Is <laughs> oh, no, you're doing my job for me. I just, I do want to, um, I do want to ask a question, which is, the, the goal is to have engagement from the community uh, and cyclists and move everybody in the same direction. Who pays for it? Who's supposed to pay for this? Pay for what? The, uh, the engagement itself, does that have a cost? It has a minimal cost. I mean, it, it's mostly time more than anything else. I mean, like if you have leaflets, but everybody has, well, actually not everybody, most people have printers at home or whatever, and that's not that expensive. Mm -hmm. um, getting a place to meet, Generally, it's easy to get a school or something or a local name. We had a local business host the last one we did, the only mm -hmm. one we did. Um, I don't think that's a real problem. It's mostly time and energy and effort and interest. Uh, and if there is any cost, if you feel the need to have you know have staff there, fine. Then the city should be absorbing that. I don't. I don't. Then that's it's a minimal cost. Shouldn't is that the is it the mayor and her staff that is to do it? Is it the council? It could it, be is it the one. ward councilor? Is it the councilor at large? It could is be the one, but like I said, I, 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 I again, you, you, you know my history well. I, I got engaged in government when, when there wasn't a, there was a real significant disagreement between people on the streets and people in government, mm -hmm. and there were, there was a very difficult time for a long time, and I was one of the people that thought you don't need government. I mean, you need government, but you don't need government to be at every meeting. I don't, I mean, invite you, I'm not looking, I'm, I don't think they should be shut out. I don't think it should be done without them. But if they don't want to come, they don't want to come. And I, that doesn't mean the community can't come together. There's, there's no requirement that we have a mayor or a city councilor in the room or a school committee person or anybody else. As a matter of fact, it used to be the people who organized those things actually became the city councilors and the mayors mm -hmm. and, the, and the like. And honestly, that was my political path is to get involved in the community before anything else. Was most, mine was mostly around development, excessive development in residential neighborhoods. That's what kind of got my political juices going at the time. Um, and this could be no different. I will tell you that traffic and transit impacts everybody, and I will tell you it is the main thing I hear average people talking about, that and the conditions of the street. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody would have a disagreement that the streets in some of them are in terrible condition and need to be fixed. If nothing else, a simple skim code on Highland Ave would make a big difference to everybody. 
why that can't get done is strange to me. Yeah, and Kat, I would say one of the things that I think that the city would really benefit from investing in if we wanted to cut through a lot of Honestly, this kind of gap where we're trying to figure out what people want. You know, we've got groups of people, smart, hardworking people, organizing in their interests and in their neighborhoods. Like, if the city, and I don't think that we will do this, but if we were to invest in a really comprehensive polling capability to be able to reach out um, into the various communities, in the various languages that people speak, to where they gather, you know, um, that. If it, would, if it was done well enough to be believable and well enough to be trusted, right. that would be absolutely an incredible way to cut through so much of this. Um, I don't know if we could do it well enough to have it be believable. You know? I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm not opposed to it, but you're right. That you will know, cost but money. At, and my observation is that it doesn't take a lot of signatures to make a city councilor sit up and take notice. It doesn't. You know, a couple dozen people. And you know, you're a charismatic, hardworking person. I can talk to people. I can get a couple dozen signatures for yeah, any reasonable paragraph. What it misses is how many doors did I have to knock? Well, that's what, honestly, that's about why it. petitions are. I've always been the person that ignored most petitions. Most people will sign a petition at the Stop and Shop or the Star Market mm -hmm. or Johnny's because they just want to get you out of their face. Um, Does Johnny's Food Master exist? They're anymore? gone, I guess. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> just checking. What ticket? But what you can still get a petition <laughs> signed. We can get a petition no, signed no, there. Oh, no, absolutely. They sold. They sold. But it's just, it, it, that, that's a beginning, it's not an end. But again, mm -hmm. that's not the same thing as having people in their own neighborhood, having their own meetings, having their own discussions. Yeah. Which again, it, it is difficult, it is time consuming, but I don't quite understand what's more important than getting people's feedback as an elected official. I, I've always thought that was the, the most important thing that you can do, is to organize people to find out what they want. And I, 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 I gotta give you one story. I had, when I, my very first public meeting, when I first got elected, all them in Ward 5 at the time, um, there was a neighborhood group at the time that decided to organize the neighborhood that I lived in that, uh, to get people to demand something. I can't remember what it was, stop sign or street light or whatever, whatever it was. And they had a meeting at St. Catharines that I went to, happy to go. And I went, there was probably 50, 60 people in the room. And the organizer was there, you know, saying, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we demand this, we demand that. And I turned to the people in the audience, I knew almost all of them. There were people I grew up with. Again, some of us changed, but those are people I grew up with. I said, do you want me to do this? I said, yeah. I said, okay. You don't have to demand anything because you're right. Mm -hmm. You get 50 good people who want something. Most elected officials, are, that's what they're there for. They're there to say, okay, I'm, I'm here to serve you. Now, again, if they don't agree with it, they'll tell you and you'll have that debate and mm -hmm. that's fair. But I, I, I do agree that if you get most, if you get enough people to do something or to agree in one way. I and mean, again, I do think that as a, I'm not big on, on special advocacy groups. Mm -hmm. It's a, they, in the sense that they have a goal and, and the goal is fine, but they don't necessarily speak for all the people that it's gonna impact. I'm, the people that get impacted have to have a voice as well. Even if they're not at the meetings and they're not one of the activists, even if they don't do anything. And a lot of people, again, the city has changed, but a lot of people, they just work all day long. And when they work, they come home and take care of the kids, or they come home and just relax, or whatever it is they do, they catch up on all the other things they gotta do. They don't have time to be advocates. And some people just don't have the inclination to do it. Some people don't have the patience. Some people don't have faith in their own intelligence to have a discussion on whatever the matter is. They feel intimidated by somebody who might overtalk them or berate them, and they won't go to meetings. That doesn't mean their opinion should be ignored. It means their opinion then has to be solicited and valued in a different way. It's one of the things I love about living where I do. I'm in Ward 2. I've uh, been there about 10 years. And we've got a neighborhood email list. People ask frequently, how do you get the word out in Somerville? Neighborhood email lists, um, where it's about a total of five blocks if you count everything. And on that list, I, they are the people I can walk around and see. And sometimes it's whose is the car alarm that keeps going off. And sometimes it's when is that construction going to be done. And sometimes it's why are they taking down that tree? But man, you light up a community of a couple of blocks and you can actually have a meaningful, diverse conversation. You get to know, the, and sometimes you say, does anybody want to play some music? And you get to play some music. And sometimes you say, does anybody want to do some exercise? And people exercise. Bridging from that even to a ward with 10,000-ish people, you know, there's <coughs> got to be something in the middle. But even from that, for the sake of, I mean, I've lived in, I've lived in my home now for 40 some odd years. I've lived in some of them my entire life. I'm on one of those email lists, and I only did it this bus lane. 
I mean, actually, I'm on two. There's one mm -hmm. with the bus lane, one in a house that was being redeveloped in the neighborhood. Pretty much overlap of the two mailing lists. And that's fine, but what about all the people that are not on those mailing lists? That don't want to share their email address, or don't, I, I don't want to listen to music. You can listen to your own damn music, leave mm -hmm. me alone. Or whatever it is. Or, or that are on the email list and don't pay much attention to it. I mean, I get email all the day. That, I will be honest with you, I'm, I can't be much different than a lot of people. I delete a lot of email before I read it because it's, don't, don't, don't. So again, I, I think that's wonderful. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's a good thing. Facebook groups, the whole thing. But there still has to be an opportunity to reach out to people that are not participating mm -hmm. in that or maybe not prioritizing it like you might. And that to me is what's the missing ingredient here is that, again, this bus lane, for all I know, everybody in Winter Hill loves it. Now, I don't hear that, but that's mm -hmm. not the point. Uh, that maybe, the, maybe I'm only hearing from people who don't like I don't know. Um, I would love to be involved in getting, you know, engaging them and listening, truly listening to them and letting them speak. Not to be yelled at, not to be belittled by anybody. I wouldn't stand for that from anybody. I, you know, you've known me a long time, Cat. I, unless I'm yelling at you, nobody yells at you. <laughs> you know, and so if I, I, and for me, that's the missing ingredient here. Not, it, it's not so much about where we all want to go. I mean, I, only because, I mean, I guess that's not, I shouldn't say that. I think most of us agree that we want to go in the same direction. I, I really believe that. But I do think there's a fair amount of disagreement on how to get from where we are, which step to take first, and how big a step to take. So we have about eight minutes left. Do we have any questions from the audience? Chris? Yes. Um, You're going to be handed a mic. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Brown. Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. May I ask you to stand? Oh, sure. Fantastic. Oh, okay. I'm wondering if there are any, uh, I know it's not a, a bus lane situation, but I'm wondering if there are any lessons to be learned from Beacon Street. Uh, from what I recall, I was there for those summer vision meetings. I think design consultants got paid eight times to design that. It took like eight years. It was a disaster. I just remember everybody, there were different interests. They finally had it set up. And then one meeting, somebody actually came, I'll never forget it, and goes, where are the bus stops? And they go, oh, yeah. Like, they literally forgot the bus stops. Uh, so I'm wondering, now now that, you know, Beacon Street is what it is, I'm just wondering, are people a little happier there? Uh, is it kind of still warfare? I know it's a little bit safer, but are there any lessons from Beacon Street? It's kind of like, as somebody who's been covering Somerville for quite some time, that was just a major thing. It was almost like a joke. You know, every year we go back and it was still a disaster. Anything there? I, I would argue the same exact thing, that again, it should be re reviewed not necessarily be changed, but to find out exactly the answers to the question you just asked. How do people feel about it today? I mean, I will tell you that I feel differently about it today than I did when I first heard about it. I don't live anywhere near Beacon Street, so I actually think my opinion is a second level opinion at best. It, it should be the people who live on and near Beacon Street whose opinions, not alone, but at least priority. So I think it would be wonderful to revisit it to see how people feel, how it's working and, and, and the like. Uh, I, and I, I can't imagine why anybody wouldn't want to do that. But I also think that this is a function, this is how I'm back involved with CAT. I think this is a function of the lack of local media coverage. I, I just really believe that today there's virtually none. And, and, you know, and, the, and the little there is is mostly kind of screaming at each other and you know, just that kind of stuff. That's a classic example of, okay, it was a controversial thing. I, I'll be honest with you, some people tried to drag me into it, and at the time I was, I was actually in Congress, and I said, that's not a congressional problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you live in some of them, Mike, you care about some of them, and I do, and I have an opinion, but I don't live there. I actually gave advice to people who had opinions, said, if I, if I lived there, and this is, what I, this is what I would do. And some people did it, some people didn't, so be it. So for me, I think it'd be a wonderful thing to follow up on, um, and I actually think if we had a more active and more productive local media, that they would be prompting just that, maybe even hosting it, which I think is what tonight is really kind of all about, is the attempt to just engage people in a, in a thoughtful discussion about an issue that does impact a lot of people. And it's not gonna, you know, this is not gonna be on CNN. <laughs> you know, they're not coming here for bus lanes and the like. This is a local issue that has, that impacts local people and should be decided and discussed on a local level. So for me, I, I think that's a great question and I hope someone is listening. I'll tell you what, Chris, you know that Beacon Street was what activated me as an activist, yeah. right? It was the, <coughs> rode my bike into Kendall Square, rode my bike back, and they'd taken out 87 mature trees in the space of a, a, a breakfast meeting. Yeah, and uh, so I can tell you now, a lot of that initial rush of anger and surprise has subsided, you know? And as you say, with 
being surprised in your home and in your neighborhood by significant disruptive change. It feels like an attack, the adrenaline goes up, you know, your back gets up, and it, when people are in that mode, it's really hard. That's when the yelling comes out. Right. You know, so having the meeting right then, that's when people yell and cuss. I would say on Beacon, one thing is that strong local supervision of anything that's a state project in our city. Uh, we, there were big gaps in the oversight there. Right, and the was that a state project? That was a state project. Why was that a state project? Uh, Ten million bucks. <laughs> okay, I'll leave it alone. Yeah, it's a city street. It's not. A, it's not a state highway. The state pays for it. The state paid for it, and the contractor was paid by the state, and so the city wow. had very little leverage over. It. Yeah. The city paid right. for the, you know. We'll have a discussion about mm -hmm. how local gets leverage over the state later mm -hmm. on. And, and a piece of this is. Stay tuned, next on Scat TV. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Chris, the other thing, oh. the other thing I would say is that um, I think that most of the folks, <coughs> at least my neighbors, think that there were some important things that were, th they could have been seen in the design and they got cut out for cost optimization. Uh, the idea of passenger pickup drop off and truck delivery spaces interacting with those bike lanes. Um, the idea of finishing the physical separation of the bike lanes, that now we're seeing the bollards go in, what happens after the bollards is eventually the jersey barriers, and then eventually the full physical separation, because we knew where we were going, we just didn't want to pay for it. And eventually, like we think now that we live there, and we know, I know at least, that we're not getting another thing on that street for 20 years. <laughs> It, it's done, and I wish we had gone all the way through, as you say. Okay, so we do agree on this. And I didn't live there during the design process, right? So I moved in 10 years ago, and the design was basically fixed at that point. You know, these things take a really long time, and I don't know how to really thread that and get the continuity well, of community all the way through. <laughs> well, let, me, let me give you another one, because you got me, you me thinking about this, McGrath Highway. Mm. And I know there was a big discussion, debate about whether they should lower McGrath Highway and all that kind of thing. In my opinion, the state was never going to do that. But that's beside the point. When the state decided to, and that is a state project, it is a state road, they're doing it now. They have a, a section of the, the road marked off so, so the construction workers have safety. Mm -hmm. I argued to the state, you just proved that a bike lane can work here. You proved it by cordoning off X number of feet and we're not terribly impacting two lanes of traffic, traffic moves fine, let's do that. And by the way, if you're going to redo the whole thing, you probably can add a couple of feet to both sides if you want to without changing the, the, the I'm not an engineer, but you mm -hmm. can probably get that done. They would have nothing to do with it. And I couldn't get the bike advocates to argue because all they wanted to argue is low of McGrath Highway. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, fine, if that's what you want to do, there's nothing wrong, okay, that's wonderful, good proposal. It's not going to happen. And, it, and you're going to tell me all or nothing? And all or nothing is exactly what we have in Washington on both sides, and that's, and you see the result there, not very good. I would argue very clearly, fine. Even if you wanted uh, the, the lowered McGrath Highway, you should still want to separate a bike lane on the existing McGrath Highway if you can get it. But just an example. So we've spent an hour now talking about a lot of ways folks that can get involved a lot of ways that we would like our city to get involved. Another way that you can get involved is that this is a production of the Somerville Media Fund. The Somerville Media Fund at somervillemedia.fund has different ways for you to get involved in your community, getting the information out, uh, supporting nonprofit journalism such as the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism and here at the Somerville Media Center. Uh, this has been a production of SCAT TV. Thank you very much to our guests. This has been a fantastic discussion. I hope you all come back. Thank you.